some of these questions uh, throughout the course to be sure that you uh, have a firm grasp on it. One of the things that I mentioned earlier, maybe the first week, I said that the financial manager's function could be identified as three policies or three major decisions. What are those three decisions of financial managers or CFOs? Remember, I said the world of finance revolves around three major decisions. Those major decisions are called policies as well. So what are those three major policies of any financial manager or CFO? Take a look at your notes, maybe. And I'm not going to answer. Can you answer? <laughs> Anybody remembers these three? Yeah, maybe? Okay. Yeah, I put all the emphasis on it on first week, perhaps. And my uh, discussion was about uh, what do you do as a financial manager to any company? These are the main decisions that you have. These are the main policy of, the, of any organization uh, regarding finance. Now, each one has its own meaning. Actually, they are very much connected to uh, what I repeat all the time, the four steps of investment. So if you think about that, actually all these policies fit that particular criteria. So meaning that when we make an investment, we have to do certain things. What are those third certain things? Most of them are about these policies, about these decisions. So when we're talking about capital budgeting, which is the first decision, what are we talking about here? Let's say I have no idea about the uh, uh, finance or any financial terms, and then you are telling me, well, we did the capital budgeting, and I'm gonna ask you, what does it mean? What is the meaning of it? What's the answer? I better go home. Man, I, this is not working. <laughs> yes, sir. Charles. Uh, is it determining how much money you will need? And for what? For operations or for a project? Specifically for investment. Your is investment there a required rate of return? No. This is basically is... Uh, how you make investments. Capital budgeting is how do you make investments. Now we already talked about it. You take four steps. Simple as that. Capital budgeting is about investment. Period. Okay? Your investment decisions. Now, what is capital structure? Capital structure is determining what? Cost of your capital, right? Is that what you're about to say, Charles? Yeah, determining cost of capital. That's called capital structure. I'm gonna spend the entire week talking about each one of these. We're gonna talk about capital budgeting. 
we're going to do some uh, calculation in the class, common operating net present value, internal rate of return of your investment. We're going to uh, spend some time on this. I'm going to spend the entire week on capital structure policies. What do you do there? Now, what is working capital? Like current assets available. Or managing your what? Cash flow, basically. Managing your cash flow. So essentially, I said this in particular, these policies fit uh, in the investment decisions in, in, in this way. Let's suppose, uh, go, let's go back to our old example. We're buying a building, uh, a condo, condominium building, or office building. It's like, uh, I don't know, 30 story building. We want to purchase that. We talked about it, what you need to do. The first step you take is what? Project cash flow generation of what? This investment. What kind of cash flow you're anticipating to receive from this investment for whatever the period that you have in mind? 10 years, 20 years, forever. And what you do, you determine cost of your capital. How do you do that? For that, you're gonna do the capital structure. Make sense? Meaning that if you are a company, the source of your capital comes from different types, different sources, uh, then you're gonna be calculating cost of capital based on cost and weight of those sources. So in other words, what I'm getting at is that you decide to issue bond and also issue stocks, let's say 50%, you issue bonds, 50% of what you need, you issue stocks. You're gonna multiply this 50% to the cost of each one meaning that how much bond, uh, bond is gonna cost you. What is the cost of bond? And I'm gonna repeat this forever. What is the cost of bond? Coupon rate. Coupon rate. The payment that you make and given to people. <laughs> Isn't that your cost? I issued bonds. I'm obligated to pay 10% to Charles because he's my bond holder. What's that's a cost for me? What is the cost of stock? What is it called? It's called cost of equity. What is that? If Stephen is holding my stocks, he's my stockholder, he is expecting a rate of return on this stock. The expected rate of return on the stock for him is cost for me, meaning that I have to deliver that 12% expected rate of return. Everybody follows me? Okay. So those are the costs of these two sources of capital, meaning I raise my money by issuing bond, by issuing stocks. 50%, 50%. Well, how much is the cost of each one? Well, bond is 10%, the other one is 12%. Okay. 12 times 50%, 10 times 50%, add them together, that's your cost of capital. Simple, huh? Okay, so that's how you determine your capital. So why it's called capital structure? Because there are many items in it. Stocks, bonds, borrowed money, short-term notes, and many, many things. You bought preferred stocks. Although you don't issue preferred stocks to raise money, but it's there, it's part of the capital. Retained earning. So, that's why it's called capital structure. The third one is working capital, meaning that now you know you know cost of your capital, you projected the cash flow that you're gonna be receiving from this investment, and, and uh, what you did, what you uh, uh, discounted all your future cash flow by the what? Cost of capital, and now you know the value of this company. Now what? Are you done? No. You're also gonna to put together a budget, put together a cash flow management for your investment. What is that? Well, how much income we're gonna have every month? This much. How much expenses we're gonna have? This much. 
and then you're going to project that for the entire year. Then you're going to say, oh my God, the month of um, August, we may run out of money, we may need $5 million. Okay, you can't wait till it happens and then say, okay, let's see where we're going to get the money. That's, that's, uh, it's going to be too late. You have to project it at the beginning of the year. So if you're going to be short of $5 million by uh, month of August, what do I need to do? Well, I better talk to my bankers, let's suppose. Well, I'm going to be shooting by, by some bonds, let's suppose. Or you may have some ex extra money. Hey, month of August, we're going to have extra $5 million. So you better plan for it. What do I mean planning for it? You're not going to put it on your vault and uh, be happy. Right? What are you going to do with that money? You're going to invest it. Right? And what are you going to be invested in? What? Short-term investments. Money market account, perhaps. So, those decisions are going to be made at the beginning of the period, beginning of the year. Working capital is about working with what? With, current, with your current assets, with your cash flow. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that today. Remember, I shall, I'll be also gonna be talking about this, capital budgeting, I think it's gonna be uh, next week, and then capital structure, the week after that. So you're gonna have a good idea about all these. Okay, so. Stephen, <laughs> you want to do me a favor, please? Okay, thank you, sir. So, one thing that I'd like to uh, share with you is um, the idea that uh, how normally businesses operate yeah, I'll, I'll give you the chart in a few seconds, but let's talk about the basics first. The idea is this. You're working capital, but you're managing your cash flow and you're managing your current assets. Uh, there are a few things that you need to uh, be very much uh, focused on, meaning that those are the most important thing that the reason as to why you want to uh, manage your cash flow. So what is the ramifications of if you are not managing your cash flow? That's a question. So hey, I'm not, I don't know how to manage my cash flow. I don't even know how to manage my uh, current assets. So what would, would be the consequence of that? What would be the ramifications of that? <coughs> Wouldn't be liquid wouldn't be liquid, wouldn't be able to pay. Suppliers. Therefore, yeah, therefore, we're not gonna be able to meet our obligations. Mean that our employees need money. I thought we're out of money. What do you mean you're out of money? Well, we don't have any money. Well, that's bad. You need to purchase raw material. You don't have cash flow to purchase all those. Those are critical decisions. Each company, perhaps the most sensitive areas of their operation and managing their finance is ensuring that they are what well, always liquid as Charles said that they have the ability to meet their obligation they have the ability to invest whenever they want they have the ability to uh, uh, finance anytime they want so uh, remember your cash flow comes from what three different sources, right? And I'm asking that and I'm asking you a question because you should have had this in your accounting course, right? The statement of cash flow, where your cash come from. Operations. Operation number one. Investment. Investment number two. Finance. Finance number three. Wonderful. At least you remember something from the past. Okay. Uh, so, how you manage that? How are you going to manage that cash flow? 
And the manager means that you're not going to be run out of it. Even if you run out of your money, at least you're going to have a plan, what? To replace it. So it's about planning. Now, one thing is critical, and I'm going to give you as relevant as it, be, uh, as it could be possible, in a mean that you're going to be uh, relating to it easily. Just suppose that we have a company here, and then we uh, have suppliers. We buy raw material from the supplier. And also, we have a operation, manufacturing. When we buy this uh, uh, raw material from our suppliers, we manufacture, we produce something by it, okay? Also, we have customers, meaning that we have the people that will buy in these stuff. A simple operation, is it? Now, all of a sudden, as a financial manager, you think about it. All right, so uh, when I buy my uh, raw material from my supplier, how long would it take in average to pay these people? Why do you want to know that? Because if it takes you in average to pay these people 10 days, however it takes an average 30 days to collect your money from your customers, you're going to be in trouble. Am I making sense? Meaning that you have to know how soon you're collecting your money from your customers and how late you're going to be paying your creditors, in this case, let's say suppliers. That needs the management, folks, because you cannot afford being out of money in the middle of your operation and not to be able to meet your obligations. So you have to plan for it. You have to calculate it. I'm going to put a chart on the board in a few minutes to show you how it works. So, therefore, we have to calculate the average period of uh, uh, how late we could pay our vendors or suppliers. We have to calculate how long would it take to manufacture or produce our product based on those raw materials. Also, we have to calculate how soon we're going to be able to sell our products. Also, we're going to calculate that if we sold our product, how soon we're going to collect our money from our customers. So that's a period of decisions from A to Z. Now, the period at which you already paid your vendors, but you have not collected your money from your customers is called cash conversion cycle. I'm going to show it to you here in just a second. Cash conversion cycle. So what's the prime focus of any financial manager to ensure that their cash conversion uh, cycle is as short as possible? Naturally, right? Hey, uh, this is the uh, cash conversion cycle, meaning the time that I don't have money because I paid my vendors and I have not collected from my customers. So what do you want to do? You want to shorten this as much as possible. You follow? Longer cash per, uh, conversion period is, uh, is it's not the good news, meaning that you're losing money. Now, is there any way that we could manipulate this as well? Not only not to lose money, but I can make money here. Meaning that period, uh, average of period that I pay my vendors and suppliers, an average of time that I'm going to collect my, uh, my money from my customers, can I make profit on this as well? What's the answer? Yes. How? Collect your money from your customers within 30 days in average. Don't pay your vendors for another 100 days. Or, I don't know, 60 days, 80 days. So how can I make money? Well, let's ask General Motors how they make money. 
General Motors, as you know, folks, make uh, crappy cars. And, and I, I, don't, I don't want to be sarcastic, but they are. I mean, most of the people, if they want to have a reliable car, they buy German or Japanese cars these days. So obviously, they've always been in trouble for the last, I don't know, God knows, 40, 50 years. But guess what? They are one of the most profitable companies in the world. And the question is, how in the world they uh, make a product that is really inferior product, but yet in the meantime, they are one of the most profitable car of making, uh, uh, or automobile making in the world. Answer to that is that their finance. Their finance make him to be more profitable. Not only do they have their own financial institutions, uh, investment banks, those are the side. Some of the policies that they have are extremely rare and profitable. Like what? Their cash conversion cycle is minus 230 days. Minus 230 days. Meaning what? Meaning that they collect their money from their customers in 30 days, but they don't pay their vendors for 280 days. So for 230 days, they have their cost, uh, vendors money in their own pocket. And we, when we're talking about General Motor and their suppliers, we're not talking about $500 deal, we're talking about billions. So a good uh, 230 days of the year, they have billions of dollars of their vendors in their pocket, therefore they're investing and making money. That's how important cash conversion cycle and working capital is. Obviously, you should not be expecting any company to be able to do that, right? Why not? Mean that we have another company manufacturing uh, shoes. We can't do that. What's the difference here? Why they are able to do that? Not all the companies are possible, uh, can do that. Because you got to put a lot of pressure, like, people want their money. Is it because this is negative, but on a smaller business of this value, the cash conversion cycle would actually be positive, meaning they got to get that whatever, like million dollars or whatever from somewhere, if it's their own pockets or borrowing it or something. Right, you know. but my question is, why General Motors cash conversion cycle is negative, but other companies cannot accomplish the same achievement? <laughs> meaning that they don't, they don't, they can't make it negative. What's the, what's the difference between GM and other companies? That's huge. Oh, yeah. Many companies are huge. I think you said like it was 280 days to pay their vendors, but then their customers have to pay them within 50 days, right? So, you know, just looking at those two variations. Okay. Right. The answer is, folks, their vendors and suppliers are making only GM parts. <laughs> so if the GM says, I'm not going to pay you for 200, what's their choice? Or we're going to go to uh, sell this to uh, Mercedes Benz. You're making only GM parts. Your existence is because GM is there. Follow? <laughs> so GM could dictate to you any, whatever they want. You follow? Okay, so. And that's uh, the strategy, uh, like Charles said, they're big, yeah, but not all the big companies do have that ability. Most of them do, however. Like Walmart, they have the same ability. Not that they have different cash cycle, uh, they have different cash conversion cycle, but Walmart's power over their supplier is, is extremely uh, high. Actually, it's, a, it's called supplier dictatorship. That's what it's called, by the way. Meaning that whatever they want, they dictate to their suppliers and they have no other choice. Why they don't have any other shows? Because how many companies, you know, or retailers, you know, in the world that they deal with you in terms of millions and 10 millions? They are making this toothbrush, okay? Walmart is buying 10 million or more from you. So whatever they say, you better say, yes, sir. <laughs> that's exactly what the, what the situation is. And that's one of the uh, success of uh, the, uh, one of the reasons for their extreme success 
is that they have uh, process innovation, Walmart does, and they do things that are mind-boggling. Um, I'm going to just give you one example of it. Actually, it's going to be topic of today, but I'm not going to be able to cover it. Hopefully, I'll cover it some other time, which is inventory management. <coughs> Uh, give you an example of how they manipulate the market and how they manipulate the suppliers. Do you guys know the uh, cost of inventory is between 20 25% of the value of a product within a year? Meaning what? Meaning that if let's suppose I'm making uh, or I'm trying to sell this mob. And the value or the price of this tin box is going to cost me between two to two dollars and fifty cents to just have this if I cannot sell it within a year. That's very expensive proposition, very costly proposition. So that's one of the reasons that many companies try to reduce their inventories. We have different systems of uh, inventory control, which uh, hopefully. I'll get the time and opportunity to share with you, uh, in especially to share with you some of the most important ones, like just in time, and uh, like uh, uh, economic order quantity. Those are actually it's very old mathematical formulas, but wonderful discussion. Hopefully, I'll get the time to talk about it. But my point at this time is this: this is a focal point for all the companies to ensure that the uh, inventory cost is as minimum as possible. For that, they use different methods and models. Now let's think, think about Walmart. When you enter Walmart store, how many items you see in there? Tens of millions, right? And it's not only one store, they have thousands of stores. So we're talking about tens of billions of items. Let's just assume the average price of each item is 10 bucks, which is conservative. So we're talking about worth of hundreds of billions of dollars of item in Walmart. Yes, that's true. And we said, what, 20, 25% of this is the inventory cost? So are we saying that Walmart has $25 billion inventory cost every year? Well, logically, they should, right? But they don't. Why not? Because it's not their inventory. Right. I, have I talked about this? Yeah. Tell me that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm wasting class time repeating the stuff that you know. That's a wonderful, isn't it? That's how they dictate their terms to their suppliers. So if the supplier says, no, it's your inventory, what's going to be happening to that supplier? <laughs> Get out of here, right? So, Jesus Christ, don't let me repeat things. I'm an old man, I forget what I say sometimes. All right, anyways, uh, so those are important decisions. What we're going to do here, I'm going to show you the cash conversion cycle and how we calculate that. And also, I'm going to put it on the board for you to see it even better. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, let's go over this uh, uh, slides, few of the slides that are about working capital. Okay, so working capital is about your current assets, like I said, managing your cash flows. Networking uh, capital is current assets minus current environment, we know all these. In your accounting course, you uh, uh, most likely have already discussed this. Um, net operating working capital, is your current current assets minus current liability less note payable? So if you take the notes payable from it, uh, your uh, net working capital becomes net operating working capital. Uh, so uh, what is current asset investment policy? Deciding the level of each type of current asset to hold and how to finance current asset. Now listen, current assets are what? What are the current assets? Cash. Uh, three of them, right? Cash, Cash account receivable, and what? Inventory. Your working capital decisions are going to be how much of each you want to hold and how fast you're going to be converting your what? Inventory to cash. 
So, in, uh, and also, it, uh, the working capital the, the policy includes some of the decisions that you make that how you're going to purchase your permanent asset and your temporary asset by what type of um, uh, cash flow or what type of money. Are you going to be uh, issuing stocks to do that or you're going to be using all your own retained earnings to do that? Or you're going to be using your ca reserve cash to do that? So we're going to see that. So your work in uh, capital management is controlling cash inventories and um, receivable plus short-term liability management. So this is uh, some uh, figures of uh, <coughs> ratios for this particular company and compared to the average of the industry, we'll come back to it later if you need to. So uh, let's move on. Okay. So. If you want to buy your assets, which always you do, how do you finance these assets? That's the question. Of course, you have what? Sources of capital. We talked about you could issue stocks, you could issue bonds, you could borrow money. Some of them are short term, some of them are long term. Therefore, how do you, which source do you use most to? Uh, buy your asset and how you manage those. Well, there are three models out there, moderate, aggressive, and conservative. In, uh, let's start with the conservative. Use the permanent, cap permanent capital for permanent asset and temporary asset. So basically what you do is, you do here, you use uh, Permanent uh, uh, capital. What is permanent capital? Let's say stocks, bonds, long term investments. For permanent assets, permanent assets are your fixed assets and also your temporary assets, meaning that what? For inventories and other things as well. Why you want to do that? Because you don't want to run out of money. You're conservative. Basically, you buy everything by issuing stocks. Let's just suppose that as an, as an example. And let's suppose you have this bunch of stocks and you have this money and you basically buy that, buy everything with that money. So you're not going to run out of money. You're always going to be uh, conservative. Aggressive on the other hand that uses short-term financing to finance permanent asset. Meaning that here you're not issuing stocks as much but you borrow money, means the short term, and by borrow money you buy assets, fixed assets, also what? Current assets, inventories, so let's suppose. What's the, why it's called aggressive? Is because uh, you don't have money. You borrow money or you're, uh, you're issuing short term notes or whatever to, uh, to get money, to uh, buy your, not only temporary assets, but also permanent assets like buildings, like equipment. On the, uh, the third one is moderate, matching the maturity of the assets with the maturity of the financing. So basically you match up maturity of both, make sure that you never run out of money, but also you don't have an excessive amount of money in your uh, uh, operation. Now, the question here is that why we don't want to have um, excessive money to take care of everything. I mean, why we want to get in trouble? Let's keep a little bit of cash uh, above what we need to meet some of those uh, requirements, some of those obligations. Why we don't want to keep a lot of cash around? That's what I'm asking. Yes? Uh, inflation? Are you just talking about like straight cash, like in a vault? Yeah, inflation's gonna get you so you, you would probably want to put it into like cash equivalents, like commercial paper or something kind of keep up with, um, you know, the interest rate and then uh, maybe also financial leverage too, yeah. Okay. It ha doesn't have to be in your wallet, by the way. It could be your checking account or any other account that you have the bank that you could withdraw any time you want. That's all cash. Make sense? Right. So 
But yes, that's so true. Because you, if your cash is idle, you're not generating money with your cash. In major companies, when we're talking about cash, we talk about millions of dollars. Or oh, you have your million dollars in your checking account that doesn't earn you any return? That's silly. Make sense? So that's why some companies, uh, or most companies, do not like to have cash around because you're not making money. So this is basically moderate. If you see that um, your long-term financing is this, meaning that uh, which basically uh, stands for stocks, bonds, and spontaneous um, current liabilities. Uh, so basically borrow money from bank, but, but in long term. Uh, so here, by issuing stocks and bonds, you're buying all your fixed assets and most of your permanent uh, asset, meaning that even your inventory. Now, this portion is if you run out of money, if you need more money here, these the portions would be fulfilled by short-term loans. Make sense? Meaning that, hey, you should buy your bonds, you should use stock, you have a lot of money, you bought all these stuff. But in case if you need some uh, uh, extra money to uh, purchase the uh, temporary needs, do it with short-term loans. So you see that your money also could be, uh, this also, I'm sorry, this is permanent uh, current asset like your inventory. These are temporary current assets. So those are the ones that you normally match with your policy of where you're going to get money. This is um, conservative, like I said. Everything is uh, financed by your stocks and bonds and spontaneous current liability. So you have even no short-term debt. Everything, every, you, you're always in good uh, condition as well as your uh, cash flow. But yet, it's not desirable. Why? Because these blue areas right here is the cash that's sitting in your comp in your hands uh, without making any money, meaning that your cash is idle there. And of course. Um, Aggressive is on the way around. So, now in order to uh, give you a better idea as far as what cash conversion cycle in CCC is, I'm going to give you a picture here. Maybe I could uh, put it on the board. Yeah, let's put it on the board. Okay. Stephen, do me a favor, please. Thank you. Anyway, these terms that I'm writing here, they are uh, 
different in uh, different books and different literature. But the one that I'm writing here is uh, the terms that I use in your book. So uh, here, again, the terms are different from literature to literature. I think we can put this period also, since everything is period, make this period as well. So this is uh, operating cycle. Okay. Now, here, I'm going to need a different color as well. Yeah, I'll use this. Okay, here, we start from here. This is where you purchase your raw material. beginning. This is, this right there, is where you pay your supplier. Okay? This is where you sold the uh, product sold. You sell your product here. And this is average, well actually collection period. Uh, well, we could say average collection period, but collection period. Collect them from your customer perhaps. Okay. Now, let's suppose each one has a time, average time. Let's suppose this period, from the day that you purchased your raw material, from the day that you paid them, paid your suppliers, paid your vendors, why there's a period in here, which is called payable deferral period? Why there is a gap here? Why you're not paying your suppliers here? So you buy a credit. Yeah. Yes, you always do that. You never can pay cash because you're buying 30 days here and they're not penalizing you. Why are you paying cash? So let's suppose this is um, 30 days. Okay. Now, from the day that you purchase your uh, raw material and you made the product, it's called inventory conversion period. Let's suppose that says that's 60 days.
and then here you set your program. But it takes you 40 days in average to collect your money from your customers. So far so good? Now, from the day that you bought your raw material up to the day that you collect your money from the customers is going to be how many days? 130. 100. 100. Uh, oh, it's sorry. 100 days. Okay? Let's suppose somebody gives you this picture. That's your operation. And asks you, okay, what is the concern here? What is the data that you need to manage? I give you everything. Hey, we buy our raw materials, we pay our vendors after 30 days. It takes a total of 60 days to produce our product, and it takes average of 40 days to collect our money. Our operating cycle is 100 days. What do we need to manage here? What, in the, what, what should be the concern here? There's 70 days without cash. Okay. So we're seeing what? 70 days we don't have the cash. So what is that period? This period is that. What is that called? Cash conversion cycle? Perfect. How many, how many days is it? Seven days. Seven days. Do you have to plan for the seven days that you run up money? You better. Now, therefore, we could write our formula for this. Like I said, these terms, inventory, cash conversion, and average collection period, these are all different, different books. So the ones that I always know is that uh, days, sales outstanding, daily sales in inventory, and so far so on. But in this view book is different, so I'm going to write whatever is in your book. So your CCC, cash conversion cycle, is equal to, I'm going to write the terms, so I have to look at here. Inventory, okay, okay. So is equal to uh, average collection period plus uh, inventory conversion period Minus payable deferral period. Or your cash conversion cycle is equal to operating cycle. minus table referral period. Okay? Now, on different books, Like I said, there are third, certain other terms used. Why I'm even bringing this up? Because in, uh, when you see in financial terms, the other ones are used, not this. I don't know why you do book is using these terms. So in other books, you're going to see 
day's sales of standing plus ale sales inventory minus days payable of standing PPO is equal to CCC. Okay, so why I'm bringing to you this to your attention is this. In other, in, in world of finance in general, folks, you're going to see these terms and you're going to wonder what is DSO, what is DSI. Actually, these are these. So I'm going to uh, repeat this. Your average collection period is called also days sales outstanding. Should I write it or you, it's okay? Should I write it on the board? Okay. So, Dale sales outstanding. Your uh, inventory conversion period is called Dale sales inventory. And your payable deferral period is called Dale's payable outstanding. So, these are the terms you're going to see in. Uh, in world of finance used uh, very commonly. They don't use these terms. These terms is for this book only. So. But uh, it just it has to say Danix regardless. Okay, so a couple of questions. Is my conversion cycle in this example, is it positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Yeah, everybody agrees? No? Yeah. Okay. So how can I make this negative? You would have to manipulate the terms on here. So you would have to, um, yeah, or well, one term, really, um, the payable deferrable period. Mm -hmm. You would want to increase that somehow, or you would want to decrease the other two Exactly. Yeah. So let's suppose in this case, I uh, don't pay my vendors for let's say 90 days and collect my money from your, my customers in 30 days. I'll be naked. And uh, also, in many cases, Companies are very fast in producing certain companies, certain type of industries, certain products, not everything. When they get their money or, or um, get their material from their um, suppliers, they make the product within like six days, seven days. But they pay their vendors what, in 30 days. So basically you have what? Uh, maybe if it's seven days, you have 23 days which is negative. Make sense? So, that's what the uh, GM does. GM actually, like I told you guys, is uh, extremely profitable because of this phenomenon. Any questions on this? Okay. Since um, I want to give you ample time to do your uh, midterm, uh, I'm going to be postponing the remainings of this discussion. Actually, remaining of discussion is some odds and ends, but this is the core of what working capital is all about. Um, but also, I'm going to add to this perhaps next week to uh, show you how do you do this. Meaning what? Meaning that what's the aim here? What's the goal here? Collect your money as fast as possible from your customers and get a pay what? Your suppliers. We're going to find out how we can do that. Which, uh, anybody knows what credit term is? You haven't heard about it? Meaning that if, uh, if uh, um, a supplier says, hey, if you pay your bill in first 10 days, 
uh, you're going to get 1% discount. If you pay your bill within 30 days, then you're okay. But if you pay later than that, you're going to be penalized 1%, so per day or whatever. So uh, this encourages your um, customers to pay faster because you're going to, some of them, they want to take advantage of the discount. The term that they use for it in this example, if the bill is due in 40 days and you um, uh, would like to give 1% one, 1 discount if it's paid in 10 days, it's called 110 net 30. That's the term that they use. Uh, we're going to talk about that. How do you uh, take advantage of this? Meaning that the question is, do you want to take advantage of this or you don't? But there is a method by which you decide. Okay? We're going to talk about some of those stuff. But for now, you kind of are exposed to the core of this working capital uh, policy in the decisions that you made based on what I put on the board. Okie doke, any questions? By the way, is. Um, Okay, we'll talk about that next week. I don't want to even open on. Okay, so let's take, uh, I don't know, uh, let's take 15 minutes and then come back for your midterm. Cycle. The reason I'm putting an emphasis on it is that you're going to see that in all the ratios when you have Ratios are not stated in the terms that your book has. Ratio is going to be stated in these terms. So they're going to say, hey, uh, what is DSL? That's the term that is used. What is DSI? What is uh, DPO? Now remember that they say it's outstanding. They say it's inventory. They is payable outstanding. Uh, so just bring into your attention that in ratios, you're going to see these, meaning that in the world of finance, these are the ones that are used. <clears throat> okay. I guess that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> now, there's a trick question in here. Because almost 95% uh, of all my students in the past missed this. And what is that trick question? It's this. What's the opposite of spot market? Spot, S-P-O-T. Spot market. I talked about it. Derivative? Derivative is opposite. But uh, what, is it, what would you call those derivatives? Come on. Future market. Spot market is what happens right now in this mo moment that you're making economic transactions. Future markets are about derivative, the derivatives. Remember that lesson. example was that if I want to pay my Japanese partner in the future, do I pay it for the rate of today or rate of what? 30 days from now. So, opposite of the spot is what? Future. On the other hand, opposite of physical market, we have what? Security, financial. Stock market as what? Well, physical location. But NASDAQ doesn't. So for NASDAQ, we say what? OTC, over the counter. So as long as you know this, you're going to be able to answer that trick question. <laughs> OK. Thanks. Ready? OK, make sure that you put your name on the cover page first.